Psalm 51, to the chief musician, a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone in to Bathsheba. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Friends, let's dive into Psalm 51. And look at a few verses more closely. There's a lot of rich language, rich Hebrew here. Looking more closely at the text and probing into it can increase our understanding and also help us avoid some misinterpretations or errors. So an important theological verse, but also one that is potentially misleading is verse 7. Verse 7 has the psalmist let's say it's uh, David as the canonical shaping would have it, confessing how deep sin runs and how much of a deeply rooted problem sin can be. It is a notion clearly from a straightforward reading of the text of original sin, but it's original in the sense of its being a problem of the state of humanity. Universally, all humans are in a state of fallenness. It's not original in the sense that it's biologically passed on, and it's certainly not original in the sense that somehow women and women's sexuality and the birthing process of women is somehow sinful. And yet some translations can give that impression. The New American Bible, the uh, modern Catholic version, is in danger of allowing that sort of reading. In sin, my mother conceived me. So the preposition here is the bait in, in iniquity, in sin. But bait can mean something beyond just in. If you look at a syntax grammar like William Sibu syntax, the third edition, section 248 gives other possibilities for the preposition bait. Not only in, but with, along with, accompanied by. The bait, kamatantia, can indicate something that goes along with something else. So it could very well be not so much that my mother conceived me in a sinful act or with sinful thoughts, but surely I was sinful at birth Sinful from the time my mother conceived me. In other words, sin was there not because of birth or linked up with birth, but from that time. And even before, what's more, that poetic seconding and deepening of the thought. Even long before I was even a living human being separate from the mother, even from the time of conception, this state of sin engulfed me and I was part of those networks and spheres of sin that, that wrap us and ensconce us. So that's one point of looking at the Hebrew to get some closer and more nuanced understanding. Let's move to the next verse, verse 6 of Psalm 51. And this is much more positive. And of course, 
major theologians like Augustine and Luther knew this truth, that although it's painful to talk about how dark and uh, original sin is, the flip side of that is how amazing and powerful and penetrating God's grace is. And we see that penetration right, right here. Yes, the psalmist admits, you, O oh God, you want truth even in the most hidden places, no matter how deeply rooted sin may be, God wants to clear away the dross and the pollution and get to the pure and the true and the real and the human, the imago dei. If we look at the Hebrew there, God is trying to get into the tuchot, the very most inwardness. The root behind the noun tuchot is tuach, which really means to keep on spreading layers over layers and coats, coat upon coat. One thinks of perhaps a caterpillar spitting a cocoon, burying oneself deeper and deeper in these layers of protective walls and facades. And if one reads the text canonically and thinks of David and his increasing attempts to cover up, um, get Uriah to sleep with Bathsheba. When that doesn't work, have him murdered, lie about it, layer upon layer of cover up and trying to wrap oneself in, in protective coatings of denial. God can just take apart that cocoon and get to the real human. Whatever spark is left of humanity, that ember can be rooted out by God and fanned and blown back into a real human being, um, getting rid of all the falsity and the lies and the foolishness. God wants truth and truth from the inside out. And even if that means conceiving a new true life in the very depth, recovering that one ember and fanning that into something new and true and living, God will do that. And God can get into even the most secret space of the human being. That's how wonderful and powerful God's grace is. The Hebrew behind the term for secret place is a passive participle, implying that the soul has been stopped up, shut off, shut up, kept closed by an external force, a pride or an idol, something that is preventing human freedom, preventing the soul from popping the cork and experiencing true, solid, exuberant life. God enters in, digs deep, conceives new life, true life, teaches wisdom in that secret space, totally recreating it. That is the message of Psalm 51.